What's up, everybody? In this video, we are going to review the 2022 AP Biology FRQ test that was administered and given on May 11th, 2022. So if you're my current student, if you're my past student, if you're my future student, or maybe you're a parent uh, who's just wondering what AP Biology is all about, or maybe you're just another student that took the exam that wasn't my student, it doesn't matter. I really hope that this video is helpful to your understanding of AP Biology and your understanding of the AP Biology test. All right, so one thing to note before we begin, um, the scoring guidelines, the samples and the scoring distributions and all the statistics that normally come out are gonna come out on July 5th, 2022. So this video is gonna air on July 3rd. Uh, so it's gonna be before all of that comes out, all right? So just a few things um, uh, to tell you, the purpose of this video overall is to share my proposed answers and explanations to the 2022 AP Biology FRQs uh, to help students prepare for future AP Biology FRQs and to honestly just do these for fun. I took the past few hours right now preparing these slides, editing this video, and I got to say it's been a joyful experience and I really enjoyed uh, just reviewing it because I want to know kind of what my students kind of went through when they took the exam. A few links in the descriptions below um, because I want you um, to um, and to really uh, use this video correctly and, and, uh, and, and well, there are timestamps. So if you want to jump ahead to any question of the six FRQs that I'm gonna cover, please uh, go down below to the description and click on the timestamp needed. Uh, there's a PDF that I'm also gonna post below of the 2022 AP Biology released FRQ questions, and then uh, a link uh, to College Board in which you can access if you view this after July 5th, 2022, the scoring guidelines, the actual answers, the student samples and scoring distribution. So why post this video? Uh, and why not just post the uh, scoring distributions and scoring guidelines that come out? Because I want you to kind of hear from me um, as an AP Biology teacher, um, kind of my thought process through these questions and kind of how I'm solving them and, and, and uh, things like that. All right, so I hope this is helpful. Please note this video is once again created and posted before the release of the uh, FRQ answers and, and, and these are my best guesses. So go easy and comment below if you uh, think there's another possible answer or if you think my answer is not correct. And uh, once again, my YouTube channel and this video is not monetized at all. I'm, do I'm doing this from the goodness of my heart. So uh, if this video is helpful to you, please consider giving it a thumbs up and uh, liking it. All right, cool. Let's begin 2022 AP Biology FRQs. The first two FRQs um, are longer ones, all right? So they're gonna have multiple parts. They're gonna have multiple um, uh, questions that are given to you. So uh, let's begin. So let me just read out FRQ number one, the binding of an extracellular li uh, ligand to a G protein coupled receptor in the plasma membrane of a cell triggers intracellular signaling. So I'm already thinking right now, um, this is, this, uh, and this has to do with a GPCR. And, and I'm thinking about the cell communication unit that we covered in class. After uh, ligand binding, GTP replaces the GDP that is bound to uh, the subunit of the G protein. This causes uh, this GTPase, GS alpha, to activate other cellular proteins, including adenylocyclase, which we've talked about in class, that converts ATP to cyclic AMP. Uh, and this is the secondary messenger that we talked about in class as well. The CAMP activates protein kinases, figure uh, 1C, which I'll show you in a bit, in cells that line the small intestine. A, a CAMP, cyclic AMP, activated protein kinase causes further signaling that ultimately re results in the secretion of chloride ions from the cells. Under normal conditions, this GS alpha hydrolyzes GTP to, to GDP, thus inactivating adenylocyclase and stopping the signal. All right, so just a few things. As I'm taking this test, which I just did, it took me a few hours uh, to review and things like that. Um, just a few notes that I wrote down. So GPCR, GTPases, they're enzymes that uh, convert GDP to, G, uh, uh, GTP to GDP. Um, so that pretty much will help activate it as well using that phosphate. Adenylcyclase, once again, what does it do? It's an enzyme that converts ATP to CAMP. And um, this all takes place in the small intestine. There's chloride ions. And uh, under normal conditions, GTP um, will become GDP inactivating that adenylcyclase. So once again, what are all these bullet points down here? As I am taking these AP bio FRQs, 
um, there's a lot of information. So what I like to do is just write down a little list of some key points. So that's what you see down there. All right. They provide us with this picture, standard picture. We've seen pictures like this in class and in our textbook. Uh, this is a GPCR. There's the three steps of perception, transduction, and response. Ultimately, we see uh, everything, you know, causing this cascade, ultimately leading to a response, okay? And then down here, as you can see, um, adenyl cyclase, when it's active right here, it's going to go ahead and convert, and ultimately, it's going to lead to uh, a CL secretion by the cell. It also gave you some more information, and here's what it says. Individuals infected with the bacterium Vibrio cholerae, cholerae, sorry, experience severe loss of water, okay? So we have read about this in our textbook, and this um, causes diarrhea or a rapid loss of water from the body. So I'm just taking like little notes, uh, and here are my bullet points that I wrote down as, as I personally went through these questions as well. So it's, it, it tells you that there's a loss of water from the body, so you don't need it. You didn't need to have known that before, but uh, it gave you that information. This is due to the effects of the bacterial cholera toxin that enters intestinal cells. Scientists studied the effects of cholera toxin on four samples of isolated intestinal cell membranes containing the G protein related signal transduction components shown in figure one. GTP was added to samples two and four only. Cholera toxin was added to samples three and four only. The scientists then measured the amount of CAMP produced by the, by the adenyl cyclase in each sample. Okay, so uh, some other things I'm, I'm, I'm writing down, GTP two and four, the cholera toxin added to three and four, and then the dependent variable is the CAMP produced. And that's what it told us here, that the, the scientists then measured. So how are we gonna measure your goal? Ultimately it tells you right here, the amount of CAMP produced. So I'm writing all that down just on the side, just so that I don't have to reread this over and over again. Here are the main points that I'm trying to get. They also gave you this diagram right here, which, which once again, we just went over the four different samples, but as you can see, one and two don't have the chlorotoxin, three and four do, and samples two and four have the GTP added. And then here it looks at, it looks as if the, it's the rate of CAMP production, which is what we just talked about, our dependent variable. Um, and as you can see here, there's different numbers. And quick glance, samples two and four, I'm seeing bigger amounts uh, of CMP production versus one and three, I'm not, okay? So these are all just things that are, I just wanna walk you through what's going on in my head as I'm reading this question. Here are the four different questions. We're gonna walk through them one by one, A, B, C, and D. And I'll kind of go through um, some uh, proposed answers, all right? So question one, describe one characteristic of a membrane that requires a channel to be present for chloride ions to passively cross the membrane. Explain why the movement of chloride ions out of intestinal cells leads to water loss. Usually the first question, as you can see right here, it has really not been, it's really nothing too difficult. It's kind of like a gimme question is what I call it. But when you just describe one characteristic of membrane that requires a channel to be present, really, uh, so here's a proposed answer here. The plasma membrane is a fossil lipid bilayer, which we've studied before. And once again, this is, this is just them kind of asking you general questions about, uh, do you know the overarching themes and the concepts that are involved? So yes, we're talking about cell membrane, the plasma membrane, same thing, is a fossil lipid bilayer, which is made up of fossil lipids. So we know that fossil lipids have a hydrophilic portion, water-loving head, and the hydrophobic water-fearing fatty acid tails, which are facing inwards, and the heads are facing outwards. So it asks you right here, describe one characteristic and explain why the movement of chloride ions out lead to water loss. So let's keep explaining a little bit more here about describing one characteristic of uh, the membrane. Therefore, the hydrophilic head faces outwards, as I said earlier, and the hydrophobic tail of the hydrophil, um, of the hydro, uh, of the fossil lipid faces the interior. Because the interior of the membrane is hydrophobic, uh, hydrophilic polar molecules, such as the charged molecules that were described there, the chloride ions are unable to cross the membrane. Thus, the plasma membrane is selectively permeable. That right there demonstrates to the AP grader that, yo, I know what's going on. Uh, and that's one characteristic of a membrane that requires channels to be present. So you can't just have the fossil lipid bilayer there and expect chloride ions and charged molecules and, and other molecules to just go through. No, for specific molecules like the chloride ion, we need channels. So a channel, so like now we're talking about like facilitated diffusion, something with a protein um, 
would allow the chloride ions to cross the membrane down its concentration gradient, high to low, without it having to interact with the hydrophobic interior of the natural phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so let's continue here. So since uh, it's so much writing, uh, I put it on, on the next slide. So on this next part, explain why the movement of chloride ions um, out of the intestinal cells leads to a water loss. Well, the movement of chloride ions out of the intestinal cells leads to the water loss because through osmosis, we know that water moves from areas of low solute to high solute concentrations. Therefore, when chloride ions or the solute travels out of the cell, it, it results in the extracellular outside region having higher solute, uh, solute concentration. The water follows the solutes, leaving the intestinal cells and leading to water loss. So when it asks you why, the movement of chloride ions out leads to water loss. It's because the water will follow where there's more solute. So that's kind of the proposed answer that we have for you for A. Let's look at B. Identify an independent variable in the experiment. Identify a negative control and justify why the scientists included sample three as a control treatment in the experiment. So this right here, and I, and I put the graphic right here below, um, kind of helped you understand that, hey, this is the dependent variable, but as we can see here, cholera, uh, uh, the cholera toxin would be the independent variable. So the independent variable in this experiment is the presence of the cholera toxin in the intestinal cell. The negative control, that is just what you're not um, putting something on. So it's something that um, hey, uh, like you're not really changing. Uh, and, and, uh, you're not really adding anything to. The negative control in this experiment is sample one because it has no G, uh, GT, uh, GTP and it has no cholera toxin. So anything that you don't touch, that you don't add anything to, that's most likely going to be your negative control. Okay, so there's that. I'm going to continue here and do this final part, justify why the scientists included sample three. So sample three here uh, has a negative and a positive here. And as you can see, we didn't get much result here. Uh, but why was that added as a control in the experiment as well? Well, the scientists included sa a sample three as a control experiment because it was used to compare the effects of cholera toxin when present without GTP. So you want to kind of use that because that has cholera, but it does not have GTP. And that serves as a really, really, really good control um, in the um, experiment as well. Since GTP is used to activate the pathway caused by the cholera toxin, this control ensured that GTP was also needed to increase CAMP, cyclic AMP production, and that cholera toxin alone would not cause increased CMP production. Okay, if I'm going too quick, please feel free to pause it and take a look at that, and hopefully that kind of makes sense to you. C, based on the data, describe the effect of the cholera toxin on the synthesis of cyclic AMP, CAMP calculate the percent change in the rate of CAMP production due to the presence of cholera toxin in sample four compared with sample two. Now, there on the formula sheet that was given to you, there is no percent change um, um, equation. However, oh, I forgot which unit it was. It was like the link genes um, graphic with, with Thomas Hunt Morgan. I remember in our class, we and we did the percent change um, um, uh, we, uh, we use the equation and we calculated it. So even if you don't know it, um, here is what we, uh, what I got for you. So when it comes to this, um, so here's a proposed answer. When cholera toxin is present, there's an increased rate of CAMP synthesis. There is a positive correlation between presence of cholera toxin and rate of CAMP synthesis. The percent change in the rate of cholera toxin is 1,170%. So that's what uh, we calculated. Now, how did we get that? Well, here's kind of the overall percent change equation. You're going to take your final minus the initial uh, over the initial. So you've got your 127 minus the initial, which is the 10, uh, over the initial, which is divided by 10 times 100. And that is how we calculated 1,170%. Describe the effect of cholera toxin on the synthesis of that. Well, and here's what we said right there. There's going to be an increased rate of CMP synthesis. All right, so there's C. D, a drug is designed to bind to cholera toxin before it crosses the intestinal cell membrane. So now they're proposing that, hey, what if there's a drug that is designed to bind it before it crosses the intestinal cell membrane? Scientists mix the drug with cholera toxin and then add this mixture and GDTP and GTP to a sample of intestinal cell membranes. Predict the rate of CMP production in um, uh, pico moles 
per milligram adenylcyclase per minute if the drug binds to all of the toxin. In a separate experiment, scientists engineer a mutant adenylcyclase that cannot be activated by the uh, GS alpha. The scientists claim that cholera toxin will not cause excessive water loss from whole intestinal cells that contain the mutant adenylcyclase justify this claim. So this is a pretty lengthy question here, but let's break it down. Okay, so let's start with um, the prediction. Predict the rate of CMP production. Well, the rate of CMP production is, is going to be the 10. And uh, we got that from the chart earlier per uh, um, MG adenylcyclase per minute. This is because no chlorotoxin would be present as it has all been bound to by the drug and GTP would be present because it was added to the sample. Therefore, the CMP production would be the same as sample two. So go back and take a look at that and I'll show it to you here on the screen in a bit. When only GTP was present and there was no cholera toxin. So that's 10 um, P moles per milligrams. So I'm, I'm gonna continue here. So why, so justify this claim down here that scientists are claiming that cholera toxin will not cause excessive water loss. Now, once again, I'm talking really quick because I wanna make sure this is an efficient video, but if I'm going too quick, please pause it, please slow it down and think about these answers here that are provided, okay? So as we justify this claim, uh, here would be a probable answer. The cholera toxin would no longer cause excessive water loss because the adenylcyclase would no longer be activated by the G protein, which was shown in the pathway, which was activated by the binding of cholera toxin on the G protein coupled receptor, the GPCR. With no, ex with no activation from the G protein, adenylcyclase will not break down ATP into CMP and the protein kinase will then not be activated. Therefore, no CL uh, is secreted from the cell. And now with no uh, CL traveling into the extracellular space, which, which is outside of the cell, the, or um, which is outside, the um, water will not travel out of the cell and therefore there's no excessive water loss, no excess water loss, okay? So take a look at that. That's what we got for you. And hopefully this helps your understanding so that when you do see these scoring guidelines, this kind of explains it a little more uh, in terms of what the answers are. All right. So once again, using those figures and using the information that was given earlier in the question to kind of help us solve this. Let's go to FRQ2. All right. So this one's another long one. I know the first one was pretty long. I'm going to quickly read through it and then I'll go through the answers. So feel free to skip ahead. And if you don't want to hear me read it out to you. During meiosis, double strand breaks occur in necromatids. The breaks are either repaired by the exchange of genetic material between homologous non tister chromatids, which is the process known as crossing over, figure 1A, or they are simply repaired without any crossing over, figure 1B. So we're going to take a look at the figures in a bit. Plant breeders developing new varieties of corn are interested in determining whether in corn a correlation exists between the number of my uh, my meiotic double strand chromatid breaks and the number of crossovers. So we know that meiosis, so this is some background knowledge that isn't given, but as I'm reading, this, this is what I'm thinking. Meiosis we know is gonna produce four haploid gamete cells. It's gonna have two cell divisions. It's gonna produce genetically diverse products. And I'm already thinking, um, even if this isn't a part of the question or the answer, there's three ways to increase genetic diversity. There's crossing over, there's uh, independent assortment, there's um, random fertilization. So that was all part of our learning. Now, it referred to figure A and B. So if you take a look, it says figure 1A, that's crossing over. And the figure 1B, there's no crossing over, okay? Um, and then it says, using specialized staining and micro, uh, microscopy techniques, scientists counted the number of double strand chromatid breaks and the number of crossovers in the same number of meiotic gamete forming cells of six inbred strains, okay? So all I'm looking at here, and once again, as I'm reading this, I'm quickly looking at the data. I'm seeing six different strains of corn. I'm seeing different number of double strand breaks. So I'm seeing the highest here in number one, and the lowest is gonna be down here in six. And then I'm seeing the average number of crossovers. So I'm seeing, once again, I'm just taking a look at the data trends. It looks like it's starting off a little higher here, and then it's gonna go down as well. So there's a direct correlation between the double, uh, the number of double strand breaks and the average number of crossovers. That's already what I'm looking at right now. Okay, so here's the four questions. I'm gonna walk through them one by one. Let's start with A. The double strand breaks occur along the DNA backbone. Describe the process by which breaks occur. So if you were to break any cell, or sorry, if, we were, if you were to break any bond between really any macromolecule, DNA being one of them, uh, uh, nucleic acids, the process by which breaks occur is hydrolysis, breaking with water, using water to break a bond. 
when a water molecule is added to the DNA backbone, a phosphodiester bond, and I don't think you need to put that in there. That's a little too specific. However, if you did, it just shows the reader and the grader that you kind of know what's going on, resulting in the DNA molecule breaking. Okay, so that's A. B, using the template in the space provided for your response, construct an appropriately labeled graph that represents the data in table one shown there and allows examination for a possible correlation between double strand breaks and crossovers. Based on the data, determine whether corn strains one, two, and three differ in their average number of crossovers. So and already I'm looking at the data and I'm already seeing that, okay, this is gonna give us some standard deviation. This is gonna give us some error bars. And we know that you can use error bars to compare different data sets. If, the, if it overlaps, it shows you that there's um, a connection. If it doesn't overlap, then it does not, okay? So when you take a look at a, here's a proposed answer here that was created. Now, um, I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger here. As you can see, it's just a simple graph. First, you uh, put the two um, axes. So you know that the um, X axis, the independent variable is gonna be the number of double strand breaks which is shown here. And then you know that the dependent variable, so how do you know, how, do you, how are you gonna measure uh, your goal? How are you gonna see which one's the best one? Well, you're gonna take a look at the dependent variable, which is the average number of crossovers, uh, which is gonna be on the Y axis. So we're just gonna graph it 710, sorry about that, 710, 19.5, as you can see. So overall, like you just wanna look at some trends. Now, already I'm looking at the error bars. Is there overlap between one and two? Nope, doesn't seem like it, but two and three there is. So that absolutely helps you out in terms of that. So construct a graph, there it is, and then determine whether corn strains one, two, and three um, differ in their average number of crossovers. So as we can see here, corn strains one, two, and uh, one, uh, and two differ in the number of average crossovers as these standard errors do not overlap. Corn strains one and two are also statistically different. However, the average number of crossovers in corn strains two and three are not statistically different because the error bars overlap between these two points. Okay, so there's uh, what we're looking at right there. So two and three are not statistically different because uh, there, uh, there's overlap between those two points. So that's kind of what helped us answer that. Okay, uh, C, let's take a look at that. Based on the data, describe the relationship between the average number of double strand breaks and the average number of crossovers in the strains of corn analyzed in the experiment. Okay, so once again, I'm gonna take a look at that data right there. And here would be a probable answer right here. Um, the more double-stranded breaks present in DNA, the average number of crossovers increases. There's a positive correlation between the number of double-stranded breaks and DNA crossovers. So we kind of referred to that earlier on and it kind of gave us the relationship between double-stranded breaks and the average number of crossovers. Okay, so there's C. Uh, let's take a look at D. Crossing over uh, figure 1A creates physical connections that are required for proper separation of homologous chromosomes during meiosis. A diploid cell with four pairs of homologous chromosomes undergoes meiosis to produce four haploid cells. Crossing over occurs between only three of the pairs. Predict the number of chromosomes most likely present in each of the four haploid cells. Provide reasoning to justify your prediction. Explain how plant breeders use the information in table one to help develop new varieties of corn. Now, this is a loaded question, all for one. And I'm sure there's gonna be multiple points here uh, for the taking. Now, the thing that came to my mind were, was what's in the red box, required for proper separation. What does that mean? In our textbooks, I don't know what your textbook looked like, but it talked about non-disjunction. It talked about when chromosome pairs fail to separate. And we learned that when um, that happens, so let's say in the top photo right here, meiosis one, what's gonna happen is it's gonna cause an abnormal number of chromosomes in the final product. As you can see at the bottom of the left picture, none, all 100% of them are going to be abnormal versus if it happens in meiosis two, 50% uh, of them in, in that picture are gonna be abnormal. Okay, so that's kind of some background there as well. Okay, so let's keep going. I know I'm lagging a bit here, but hopefully uh, I'm still coming out clearly. Okay, so I kind of just drew something for you and hopefully this helps you understand um, instead of just giving you an answer, I kind of want to draw it out for you. So uh, as you can see here, uh, it says, um, a diploid cell with four pairs of homologous chromosomes, crossing over happens between three of the pairs. Now, if crossing over happens, then it's allowed to split. So let's say in this picture here, 
um, three uh, of the pairs were able to separate the top three, but that last one wasn't able to. So let's say if that last one wasn't able to, then what's gonna happen is, so if I'm counting chromosomes here, one, two, three, four, five in red are gonna go to the left, three chromosomes are gonna go to the right. Now, why do I put 10 chromatids? Because if you take a look at uh, each chromosome has, has two chromatids, or in the end, they're gonna be individual chromosomes. Sorry if that confuses you. You can just view it as five chromosomes, that's fine. But five go to the left, three go to the right. So that's the first division. But what about the second division? So after the second division, what's gonna happen? As you can see the right there, imagine the 10 dividing into two becoming five and five. Imagine the six becoming three and three. Okay, so pause it there and if you want to take a look at that and I really hope that this drawing helps your understanding of what's going on now. Um, okay, and I think I'm lagging here but I'm just going to keep going and hopefully my voice is coming out clear and I know my picture is a little bit slow. Okay, so um, here's a proposed answer but go back to the picture earlier and hopefully that helps you understand kind of um, uh, where all these answers are coming from. We predict that two of the four final haploid cells will have three chromosomes. Okay, so that's what I said earlier. Or uh, you could use um, six individual chromosomes or six chromatids. And the two other haploid cells will have five chromosomes. This is because during meiosis one, only three pairs of homologous chromosomes are correctly separated. While in one pair, non-destruction occurs. And they both end up in one cell, as I showed you there uh, um, in the previous graphic. Therefore, at the end of meiosis one, one cell has five chromosomes, uh, 10 individual chromosomes, and the other one has three chromosomes, six individual chromosomes. So that's kind of what we got there. Now, what about the second part? So the second part, explain how plant breeders can use this information in table one to help develop new varieties of corn. Well, in meiosis two, when sister chromatids are separated, okay, okay, so that's actually a continuation of my last answer. So let's take a look at the middle. If the plant breeder wants to develop new varieties of corn, they should increase the number of double-stranded breaks present in the corn DNA. Well, why would you want to increase the number of double-stranded? Because we know, based on what the reading was telling us earlier in the question, that would increase the average number of crossover events. And more crossing over events means more variation, resulting in an increase of varieties of corn. This data is reflected in the table as more double-sided breaks lead to more crossing over. Okay, so that is FRQ number two, okay? So now let's go on to FRQ number three. All right, FRQ number three. And I'm once again, I apologize if I'm lagging a bit, but hopefully this helps you and hopefully my voice is pretty clear. All right, so let's take a look. Um, switch the screen right here. Okay, here's a question. And if you uh, wanna jump to the answer, go ahead and skip ahead in the video. Fireflies emit light when the enzyme luciferase catalyzes a reaction in which its substrate D-luciferin reacts to form oxyluciferin and other products. So you don't need to know anything about luciferin. It'll give you everything you need in figure one, which I'll show you in a bit. In order to de determine the optimal temperature for this enzyme, scientists added ATP to a solution containing D-luciferin, luciferase and other substances needed for the reaction. They then measured the amount of light emitted during the first three seconds of the reaction when it was carried out at different temperatures, okay? So here's the um, graphic that was shown, the, uh, the reaction. As you can see, D-luciferin plus oxygen plus ATP through an enzyme called luciferase is gonna create oxyluciferin, CO2, AMP, monophosphate, um, PP and light, okay? So there's the uh, reaction that's given to us in the question, okay? So here's the four different questions and I'll go through them one by one, A, B, C, D, uh, A, B, C, and D. So here's A, describe a characteristic of the luciferase enzyme that allows it to catalyze the reaction. Well, here's a proposed answer. So What's the characteristic of the enzyme that allows it? Well, this enzyme is very specific and we know that enzymes are specific. So here's a proposed answer. The luciferase enzyme has a specific active site that is able to bind D-luciferin and oxygen, allowing it, as we saw in the reaction before, to catalyze and lower the activation energy of the chemical reaction, resulting in new products being created from the reactants more quickly. All enzymes have a specific active site as form results in function. 
Therefore, luciferase has the right form and shape to bind to its substrate, allowing it to function in catalyzing its substrate reaction. Okay, so there's what we got uh, for A. Okay, that one just tests you about enzymes in general. So pretty straightforward. Now let's look at B and let's take a look at what they're asking us. Identify the dependent variable. Well, it shows right there in the actual question, the answer. So the dependent variable, as it says, is what's being measured. It's the amount of light emitted during the first three seconds of the reaction. So that's B, okay? C, state the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis in this, so usually a classic null hypothesis like we learned in class, it was the observed, uh, sorry, there's no statistically different um, or a big enough difference between the observed and, and, and expected. So similarly to that, take a look at this, the change in temperature will not affect the amount of light being emitted from the reaction in the first three seconds. Okay, so there's uh, the null hypothesis. D, a student claims that as temperature increases, there will be an increase in the amount of light given off by the reaction in the first three seconds. Support the student's claim. So here is a proposed answer. This student is correct because increasing the temperature increases the kinetic energy, think about that, the movement of molecules. This increase in energy allows the reaction to overcome its activation energy, allowing it to occur, to occur, to occur quicker. Therefore, more D-luciferin will be converted into oxyluciferin as the by, and as a byproduct, more light will be released. So once again, what we're attributing this to is more kinetic energy, quicker reaction, more happening, and more light being released based on the equation that was given to us earlier in this question. Okay, so that's FRT number three. Now here's FRT number four. Now, once again, I think I'm lagging my, my image, uh, but hopefully my voice is not lagging and hopefully this video has been helpful and that you continue uh, watching, all right? FRT four, Ex let me read it for you. And if you need, and if you don't want me uh, to read it for you, please jump ahead. Existing isolated brook trout populations in Newfoundland, Canada, were once part of a large population that was fragmented at the end of the most recent glacial glacian period of about 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. Researchers investigated 14 naturally separated stream populations of brook trout. They found that the populations are all genetically distinct and show differences in morphology. Okay, so we're seeing different populations. Okay, so let's go through the four different questions and I'll go through them one by one. Let's start with A. Describe the prezygotic barrier, which we learned about in class, five of them, I believe, that results in these genetically distinct populations. Well, I would attribute this to habitat isolation. So here's the proposed answer. The prezygotic barrier that resulted in these genetically distinct populations was habitat isolation. This is because the populations were separated into several different populations, resulting in the organisms being unable to encounter each other and mate. So there's different habitats and they're never gonna meet. So that's something that's gonna prevent um, these uh, two from even meeting. So let's take a look at B. Brook trout with longer fins are able to swim faster than brook trout with shorter fins. In one of the Newfoundland streams, the main prey of the brook trout evolved to move faster. For brook trout living in the stream, explain the difference in fitness. So we know that fitness is the ability to survive, but not just that, the ability to reproduce. But you've gotta survive first in order to reproduce. So explain the difference in fitness between longer finned individuals and these shorter finned individuals. Okay, so here's a proposed answer. For brook trout living in the stream, those with longer fins are able to swim faster than those with shorter fins, resulting in long finned fish being more capable of, ca of catching their main prey, which has evolved to move faster, okay? Therefore, the long finned fish have a higher fitness than those with shorter fins because they can obtain more food, resulting in them more likely to survive and reproduce, allowing them to pass on their genes to their offspring. Okay, so there's a proposed answer for B. Here's C. If two morphologically and behaviorally distinct populations of brook trout remain isolated for many generations, predict the likely impact of those populations. So most likely what's gonna happen is speciation. Now, why species can going to happen because as time goes on, there's going to be more and more greater genetic variation between the two populations, resulting in individuals from the two populations being unable to mate with each other. That's what happens when two populations are separated for a prolonged period of time. Thus, the populations would eventually become two different species. So that's the prediction on what's going to happen 
if uh, morphologically and behaviorally uh, they're isolated for many generations. Last one, D, researchers claim that there are more genetic differences between any two current brook populations than there are between a single current population and the ancestral brook trout population from which all the trout are descended. Provide reasoning to justify their claim. Okay, here's the proposed answer. So any two current brook trout populations have experienced habitat isolation from each other, resulting in, in a significant amount of genetic variations between the two populations. On the other hand, every current population is descended from the ancestral population, so they will likely have many similar genes that were passed down from the ancestral population. So as you justify the claim, why is this um, going to happen? It, it also goes back to habit isolation. When you're not in the same place, what ends up happening is reproductive isolation. And over time, it can um, create many different, uh, many differences between you. All right, so hopefully that helps. Now let's do FRQs 5. And once again, if I'm lagging, uh, I apologize for that, but I'm just going to keep going and hopefully my voice is not lagging. All right, five, the following models. So they give you two models, community A and B, represent all of the interacting species in two different communities within some of the same species in feeding relationships. These models assume that both communities have the same initial biomass, okay? The models can then be used to understand the effects of human activities on the community. So here we see a food web, as you can see, or a food chain as well. Primary producers, primary consumers, secondary and tertiary consumers. But immediately I'm already noticing community A is way more diverse and community B is not. So if, yeah, so there's multiple producers, multiple consumers in A, but not as many in community B. That's already what I'm noticing. I'm gonna go through the four different questions. If you wanna jump ahead, please do but let's go start with A. A, describe a characteristic of a community that makes a species invasive that a community that in, in that community, but not invasive in a different community. So what makes a, in a, a uh, invasive species invasive? Well, a characteristic of a community that makes a species invasive in that community is a lack of natural predators. If you don't have natural predators, then yeah, you're going to be dangerous to the rest of the people around because not no one can kind of attack you that prey on the invasive species. On the other hand, the same species is not invasive in a different community because that community most likely has natural predators that prey on that invasive species or on that species. Let's look at B. Explain why removing species PP1 will have a greater effect on community B than on community A. Well, as I said earlier, removing species in PP1 will have a greater effect on community B because uh, than A because community A has a lot more species diversity versus community B, which does not have as much. Therefore, community A would be much more resistant to major changes in the environment, such as the removal of species PP PP1. To clarify, if PP1 was removed from community A, only one of the four primary consumers, not producers, consumers, to so look at the second column, would lose their only food source. Whereas in community B, only one of the two primary consumers would lose their food source. And let me pull up the graphic again for you right now as well so you can see that. So once again, we're seeing the four different primary consumers here versus the two here in community B. Okay, now let's go to C. So for C, it asks you, in an invasive species, INV, that eats individuals of species SC2, right there, is introduced into community B. Using the template in the space provided for community B, and indicate the feeding relationship for this invasive species by correctly placing INV to represent the invasive species and an arrow to represent the feeding relationship within community B. Now, okay, a few things. Number one, uh, we, uh, we put it right there, INV, and we put an arrow to it, meaning that the energy is gonna to go to it. Now, because it's an invasive species, there's no natural predators. So there's nothing that this INV will go to. So there's no arrow going away from it, just to it because the invasive species is attacking SC2. So that's what I would do if that was uh, the AP exam. Okay, let's look at D. Explain how human activities that add toxins to the soil could change a community with many species at each trophic level, such as community A, into a community with few species at each trophic level, such as community B. So how do, how, do, how do human activities that add toxins change the community overall? Well, if human activity resulted in toxins being added to the soil, many of the primary producers in a community with many species at each trophic level, such as community A, would actually die off because those toxins added to the soil would affect them. 
and and um, they would affect the um, primary producers, which then will then get the consumers, et cetera. And then it'll move all the way up uh, the chain and web, resulting in a severe decrease in biodiversity. Furthermore, due to most of the primary consumers dying off, the upper trophic levels, as I just said, would also be significantly affected because they would experience a severe lack of food. This would ultimately result in a community with very few species at each trophic level, such as community bees. So how did that come, come about? Perhaps that was a probable reason, okay? Okay, now let's go to the last FRQ. And if you've watched this all the way through, wow, thank you so much. Hopefully this has been helpful. This is just for you. FRQ six, when I first read FRQ six, I gotta be honest with you, I was overwhelmed because it's super long and it kind of scares you up front. But as I started looking at the answers, uh, it wasn't as bad as I thought. So let's read through it. And once again, if you don't wanna hear me read through it, please skip ahead and take a look at the answers. But let me read it to you. Researchers are studying the use of RNA vaccines to protect individuals against certain diseases. To, de to develop the vaccines, particular cells are first removed from an individual. Then mRNAs coding for the specific proteins from a pathogen are introduced into the cells. I'm already thinking mRNA, uh, DNA mRNA protein. So mRNAs are what produce proteins. The altered cells are injected back into the individual where these cells make the proteins encoded by the introduced mRNAs, the individual then produces an immune response to their proteins that will help protect the individual from developing a disease if exposed to the pathogen in the future. When introduced into cells, the mRNAs used for vaccines must be stable so that they are not degraded before uh, the encoded proteins are produced. Researchers develop several modified caps that they hypothesize must uh, make the introduced mRNAs more stable than mRNAs with the normal GTP cap. To test the effect of the modified caps, here we go. The researchers produced mRNAs that differed only in their cap structure. So you've got three of them right here. Oh, sorry, four of them, no cap, no, five of them. The normal cap, modified caps one, two, or three. They introduced the same amount of mRNA to different groups of cells and measured the amount of the time required for half of the mRNAs to degrade, mRNA half-life, and the total amount of protein translated from the mRNAs. So that's gonna be seen in table one. So they give you all this and immediately I'm already looking. Okay. No cap. I'm looking at normal cap. I'm looking at modified cap. I'm already looking at the biggest numbers. I'm looking here at modified cap two and the normal cap. Oh, sorry. And the modified cap three. Those are the two of the bigger ones. And then I'm seeing which ones produce the total amount of protein. Well, it looks like this one modified cap two is already producing lots of protein. So already in my head, I'm already kind of debunking that in my head. Let's go through the four questions and let's go one by one and start with A. Based on the data, identify which cap structure is most likely to protect the end of the mRNAs from degradation. So as I uh, kind of just said right there, based on the data, identify which cap is most likely to protect. So how do you, why is that gonna protect it? Well, it produced the most protein. So as you can see, modify cap two. So that would kind of be my reasoning there, okay? That's based on the data. Let's look at B. Based on the data for the mRNAs with modified caps, describe the relationship between the mRNA half-life and the total amount of protein produced. You actually don't even need to know exactly what half-life is. You just gotta look at the data that's shown there as well. So as the mRNA half-life increases, the total amount of protein produced also increases. So let's go back. So if you take a look as the mRNA half-life increases to so the highest one right here, well, so what's gonna happen, the, the direct correlation is gonna happen in the amount of protein. So the half-life is high and the protein is high when it comes to this data set that's given to you. And that's what it asks you based on the data. So describe the relationship and that's what it is. Now let's look at C. After examining the data on mRNA half-lives and the amount of protein produced, the researchers hypothesized that each mRNA molecule with modified cap one was translated more frequently than was each uh, mRNA molecule with normal GTP cap. Evaluate their hypothesis by comparing the data in table one. So the hypothesis is correct. This is because although the modified cap one uh, half-life was lower than the normal GTP cap, the modified cap one mRNA still translated a lot more protein than the normal GTP cap mRNA. Thus the modified cap one RNA must have been translated more frequently than the normal GTP cap mRNA. So look back at the data and you'll kind of see that that's true. Last one, introduction of mRNAs into cells allows these cells to produce foreign proteins that they may that they might not normally produce. Explain why the production of a foreign protein may be more likely from the introduction of mRNA into DNA. 
So here's a, a proposed answer. The production of a, pro, of a foreign protein may be more likely from the, from the introduction of mRNA than DNA because DNA requires transcription factors and RNA polymerase in order to be transcribed, versus, uh, which is then translated, whereas mRNA can go straight into protein. So when you look at the central dogma, DNA, mRNA, protein, well, if you go all the way back to DNA, it's going to require more steps and more things involved versus RNA can go straight to protein. So thank you everybody for watching until the end. I hope this was helpful. I wish you the best on your AP test. Even if you haven't taken yours and this is just a practice or something like that, I hope it's been helpful. Remember, you are not defined by your AP score. This is one test of many in your life and you'll have way more chances than one. So reflect, grow, and continue to enjoy learning. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it's been helpful. Please click the like button if you liked it and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.